Hi everyone, welcome to SG Nove, welcome to Bash. Thank you for joining us today. I know it's not exactly sundown yet, but it'll be sundown really soon. So um, just wanted to welcome you guys to Sundown Drinks, where it is a talent networking session um, intended to facilitate interactions between our, ex our ex industry experts, like what you'll see here, um, as well as talents and uh, startup founders. So um, I'd like to just you know invite you guys to, you know, just Think of this as a very lively um, discussion. So anytime you feel like you want to ask a question, um, please go ahead. Um, without further ado, I'd just like to pass the time to our lovely Juliana, who will kick off today's session. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming. There are still some seats available. So for those that are currently standing, if you want to sit down, it's going to be more comfortable, I suspect. So let me do a short introduction. I'm Juliana, the head of HR. Oh, they squeezed my photo in last minute. Yes, I'm standing in for my colleague Victor. So for Victor's fans who are here today because of Victor Tan, sorry, he's not here. You have me, the prettier version of Victor Tan. <laughs> so welcome to Sundown Drinks. Uh, I head the talent networking team. So my job is uh, all day long. I do meet people, interesting, exciting, fun people who want to do something in the startup space, either to help uh, a startup or work in a startup or somehow contribute in a startup or even form their own startups. So we are very lucky with us today. We have um, you know, three founders at various stages of their startup journey and I'll let them introduce themselves uh, to you one by one. And we're also joined by Carl, who's flown all the way from North America to join us for the workshop that we had this afternoon. So for those of you who didn't know, we had a workshop uh, around compensation structures uh, in the startup world, right? When do you give folks uh, employee stock options? Uh, when do you give people base salaries, commissions, etc.? So that was a little bit more deep dive into the dollars and cents. So now today's topic or this afternoon's topic is beyond the dollars and cents, right? What can we do to attract and continue to retain our talent? All of us know it's so difficult to find them. It's even more difficult to keep them um, beyond just giving them money. Because in this journey, I've been in this journey for pretty long, and in 20 over years, we've tried everything. We've thrown money, we've tried throwing career progression, we've divided it so that people get promoted every two years or so, even one year. Then we realized, actually, it's not that. They wanted job exposure, so we started giving them rotations, etc. And we've tried everything possible. So beyond dollars and cents, what else can be done? Like I said, take a think of this space as my living room. You're all my guests. So anytime you have questions, you want to interrupt, you disagree with us, you want to say something, by all means, raise your hands and yeah, feel free to say something. All right, thanks. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Arroyo. I'm the founder and CEO of Tiger. Uh, Tiger is a company uh, out of Singapore. We are present currently in six countries. Hyper growth modes, uh, we are 150 people at the moment. Uh, very, very fast, hurrying a lot. And uh, we serve the financial industry by providing um, artificial intelligence solutions around document reading and understanding. So basically processing and structure information and converting that information into data for the benefit of different uh, business processes and applications that the financial institutions run. Hi, uh, my name is Finn. I'm the founder and CEO of MoneySmart. MoneySmart is uh, one of the region's largest financial aggregators, so we help consumers uh, compare and get the best loans, insurance, credit cards, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, we have about two and a half million uh, sessions in traffic in Singapore. You know, four in ten Singaporeans uh, visit our site every month, uh, and you know, we hope to raise the level of financial savviness uh, with, with consumers and help match the right consumers with the right product. Thanks, my name's Kyle Holm. I work with uh, Aon. I lead our private market practice globally where we work with high growth companies. Um, that would include sort of an Airbnb or some of the earlier stage companies. And we also work directly with the investors. So the Sequoia Capital and the soft banks of the world helping companies grow and really enabling founders to, to meet their goals. Hello everyone, my, 
name is Li Guangdan, I'm the co-founder and CTO of vSense. Uh, we are a Singapore-based company. So our core technology is image recognition and also computer vision, uh, as well as deep learning. So uh, if you use the uh, uh, Samsung, Huawei, or uh, Oppo, Vivo phones in Singapore, our feature actually are embedded in their uh, native camera. When you open the camera, you can take a photo to shop. So by, by you know, uh, the, the photo you take, and so we'll find the, the similar or exact products. We also work with companies like, uh, uh, you know, major retailer like Adidas, Uniqlo, H&M, you know, to serve our technology to, through their platform to the end consumers. We have around uh, 100 people. Uh, we have office in uh, Singapore, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tokyo, uh, Beijing, uh, Ireland, as well as uh, Bay Area. You need to pass the mic around. It's going to take a while. Oh, you have one. Okay, cool. So, yeah. Uh, is it on? Tech support. Okay, let me start off with a question. So, um, Victor has kindly provided me a list. Uh, and by all means, it's not a comprehensive list. So, anytime you guys want to ask something, go ahead. So, Sinway, we talked shortly before the panel started, and I was just telling him that when I first found about Tiger, they were less than 20 people strong. And that was in 2015, right? And, and now, fast forward, he tells me he has 150 and growing to 200. Now, that's a really big jump in terms of the hiring rate. SG Innovate, when we started, it was 20, and I thought I did a damn great job because we are now at 45. Ha ha ha. So it looks like I've got a, a, a ways to go. But in any case, you know, I'm curious to hear from your point of view as well as you know, the other founders when at different stages in your journey, uh, what was the first few hires that you thought were critical, that were important, um, and how do you prioritize them? Um, I, I think intuitively, everybody would think that the most important hires for a technology startup will be uh, the technology people. Um, that is partly true. Uh, we had that cover with the founders and, and the core team. So for us, the more important hires were actually the salespeople. Um, companies, at least in our, in our space, are uh, investors wants to see growth, uh, wants to see, get excited by the growth they're achieving. We are not a B2B, uh, so we're not a B2C. So it's not about you know, how many customers, how many retail customers you have. It's about how much your revenue is, is growing. Uh, so founders, of, uh, oftentimes, I think we make the mistake of just because of our technological background, I hold a PhD and all that stuff, right, uh, of focusing on the, um, on the technology. Uh, but investors are not very excited about the technology. Obviously, that must be a check, but they want to see you growing. So it's, 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 it's very natural that we focus on hiring very good technology people, and you should, uh, but then we turn a blind eye onto the sales and, and marketing. And if you don't have the sales and marketing, you're not going to sell. And if you don't sell, you don't get revenue. And if you don't get revenue, investors don't want to invest in you. So, yeah. Uh, I think for me, it's similar as well. Uh, so uh, I bootstrapped the company for the first four years. And I started when it's about 10 years ago now. So very different landscape you know, in terms of capital availability uh, to, to what we see today. Uh, and I started this business pretty much straight out of college, right? So I put in the last of my savings, which was like 5,000 bucks. First hire I made, outsourced all the tech to get an MVP up and running. And the first hire I made was uh, somebody to do sales as well. And once again, given that it was a bootstrap company, you know, the most important thing is getting, <laughs> getting revenue because uh, we weren't relying on, on funding to sustain the business. And once you know that your revenue is higher than your costs, reinvest that and slowly grow. Uh, over time, so so yeah, sales for sure. <laughs> so I, I'll take this from a different perspective, and that's who are the founders asking us uh, how they can compensate and find, um, and what's the role that sort of most surprises them in terms of what it demands, and it's the CMO, the Chief Marketing Officer. Um, I think the kind of the financial positions, the tech positions. Um, even kind of the peer play sales positions tend to be sort of a known marketplace. Um, but what we're seeing right now is really the CMO, the chief marketing officer, just want to make sure that wasn't feedback. Um, it's really the role where it, there's incredible demand um, and it is probably, um, you know, I'd say the, you know, the pivotal role at, at this point for a lot of industries. 
I, I think uh, the early hiring definitely is very, very hard, no matter the sales role or uh, technology role. So I can only talk my example. My early members, actually, uh, we work together in the uh, same research lab. So these are the research assistant, research fellow working with me. We have already built up the confidence, you know, and also trust within each other. And also, you know, but of course, you know, you want to uh, scale, you need to hire more. And uh, we basically, I think I remember, I, I start to buy lunch for our students, you know, and then let them to introduce more students to me. And then we identify some early members. So, uh, and also I research on, you know, uh, I use some keywords to uh, search for certain research topic. And then, you know, use a lot of other keywords you mentioned to look for different research institute in Singapore, asking for coffee, you know, and write some good emails to ask for, you know, for meetings, et cetera. So, so these are like sales process. You need to do a lot of outbound, you know, to let people to know, know you. Yeah. And when you first started out, obviously pretty small, bootstrap in some cases. How do you manage to attract people to want to join you? Like, were there special reasons that you give them? Did they believe in the company vision, mission? Um, was it about the founder himself, or there was some special magic that you conned the person to join you? Um, I think it's different from role to role. Uh, if you focus on the on the salespeople, they will just probably focus on, on, on their commission and, and making their commissions very big, so it means the company is growing very big. Uh, but let's focus now on the other ones. Uh, I think um, um, the most important thing is to give them to give the engineers uh, a complicated task, uh, something that they are proud to solve, something that is uh, at the edge of their capability, something that helps them uh, progress and, and grow. So I don't think it's so much about the money, and especially for the wrong um, approach to try to compete with the big guys on, on the perks because we don't have the funds. Uh, we cannot offer lunch or, you know, uh, all, the, all, the, all the gym or the napping or, I mean, napping, yeah, you can nap, uh, all that stuff. So you have to focus on giving them a challenge that is interesting enough. Some others are very driven by, there's, there's some aura of micromanagement, I feel, in, in, especially in this part of the world. People tend to be in, in some industries and some areas micromanaged. And, and we try to do something different. We just we don't have the, the bandwidth because we are growing so fast to micromanage people. So we just put them there, give them a bloody hard problem or give them responsibility or, you know, just, uh, and, and it's very polarizing and, and, and very fast. So people uh, stay there afloat or some people sink. And then you know who is good for your business and, and who isn't. But those that, are, that thrive, those are very strong uh, performers. And um, also encourage, uh, appreciate the opportunity that you give them to the personal development and continue growing uh, faster. So we have, for example, people that came from UBS or Accenture, all these guys, and uh, we, we couldn't pay that much as, as, as they paid on their jobs. It's still, they, they came and um, at the year review said, um, did we fulfill our promise that you were going to grow faster as a professional? I said, yeah, one year in Tiger, it's like two years at Accenture because you give us so much, honestly, no? I swear to God, uh, they, you, you give them, we give them so much um, space to do things. We also give them a space to make mistakes, not to make a mistake, right? But, and that, um, and that attracts more people and more good people. So it's like a positive loop that you build. Um, in my experience, there's two main things that attract people to join early stage companies. It's, it's, uh, it's learning and creation. So, you know, um, in the early days, like, you know, you can't afford to hire, especially if you're bootstrapping, you can't afford to hire people with any level of experience. But what you can hire is uh, young people who are eager to learn, right? And especially if you have a skill set and you just need arms and legs to do certain things, what attracts them to join is a compelling vision and a learning opportunity to be able to work with a founder that does have some experience, who's willing to take a chance on somebody young and, and eager with no experience to be able to build out that job. So, uh, so that's one thing. The second big thing is creation, right? So what's exciting about joining a startup, especially a very early stage startup, is people want to contribute and create something. So if you're in a team of five people, you can't really have anybody who's a, a dead weight, right? In, in a quarter, everybody is laser focused on delivering an outcome and you'll be able to collectively see how the company has shifted from quarter to quarter in a relatively short time frame. 
and people know what their individual contribution is to how the company is progressing forward. And so, you know, I think if I had to distill it down, it would be, you know, learning and creation is the, the two biggest sort of drivers for, for people to join early stage startups. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we always tell our clients that if your employees are looking at the paycheck or it's about pay, then you've already kind of lost the battle. I mean, it's really about the mission, the purpose, the service, and I think in technology, um, the, the companies that seem to be attracting the most and kind of the easiest are the ones that are really either disrupting or building something that's that's completely new. Um, you know, so in retail, it would be the companies that are, you know, sort of going in a completely different direction. Um, in life sciences, it'd be the ones that are combining kind of engineering um, and, you know, the sort of the life science play. Um, but really, the mission um, is gonna be the most critical piece. I think, um, so w we had a, a session where Laszlo Bloch, Bloch, who was the CHRO at Google, was asked this question by a bunch of people who were essentially, um, you know, kind of in that founder space, and they said, how can we compete? Um, and he said, you can't, you will not, we will not be beaten on compensation, so you really shouldn't try. Um, which I think was kind of a fair thing for him to say, right? He's basically saying like, it doesn't matter how high you go, we'll beat you and, and we can. But what he did say was, if you wanna beat us, you know, go with the mission, go with purpose, go with something, because that's what we lose to all the time, right? At, at Google it's so big um, that, that they can't, but, uh, you can provide them an opportunity to build something that they just can't at Google. So uh, from my perspective, I think for early uh, stage startups which can, which can attract uh, talents, I think two, three things are important. First of all is, uh, you know, uh, impact. So uh, probably related to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe mission. Because but most of the companies don't have a mission or vision in the first place. So then later phase to make things uh, better, and you have these things. But uh, really the impact. You know, because this guy will give up their, you know, high paid job to work with you, and really he or she make an impact, you know, in your, in your new vertical, in the history, maybe in a certain country, this impact will drive the people to really, really give up things and then join a startup economy. The second piece actually, uh, probably related to culture, but also I, I call it happiness, you know. Can he come here to work very happy, uh, happily every day? You know, you know the people are nice, and also you can you can enjoy the victory together. The whether you can get the happiness from the work from this uh, new startup life is very important. The third thing probably is the ability to deliver it. So usually for the good candidates, you just cannot close them. You know, within a day, you need to have a few rounds of it's just like enterprise sales. You know, you build up relationships, and also uh, you know you keep this uh, connection, tell them the uh, new things, upsell new products. And then you see, they, then they will see the ability you deliver things. And then you, the time you have, you can close them. So, so also this will create the content for them. Once you join this company, you know, they will work with you to create a better, you know, uh, impact, yeah. So I just want to expound what uh, Guang Da said about this happiness thing. I think it's uh, practically impossible to be happy every day at work because there'll always be challenges. Sometimes I feel, uh, personally, my own take in it, is that when you work together, trying to solve a difficult problem together, the team actually grows stronger because you're in it together. It's not just the happy times, but it's also the sad and di you know, difficult times that's the defining periods. So in a startup, there are many periods where you come into difficulties, and coming together as a team really helps bond the team. The other ways you know, that Carl talked about and, and was mentioned by Vinod, etc., um, about being creative and how you engage your candidates, your talents, right? So I just want to share with you a message I received not too long ago when I made a reservation at this place. So normally you get the day before you get the reservation, the place telling you, oh, don't forget, you know, just a reminder, you have a reservation with us tomorrow at this time, right? So what I got was really cute, so I'll read it out to you. Good day, Juliana. Your reservation here at blah, I won't say where, is only an evening away, and we're excited to host you for a wonderful time together tomorrow evening. We are bracing ourselves for you, so no drinking tonight. Well, goes to show where I'm going, lah. Yeah, so, <laughs> so yeah, I would like to say that, I mean, this thing is something to consider, right, that these very sincere messages on how you want to engage with your talents really does shine through, and I've met people from Google and Facebook and the likes who said, we really do lose out to the smaller guys because they go all out to try to tell the talent what they can offer 
in terms of what you know, Google and Facebook can't do, right? So that's where I don't think you need to um, go all out and fight in terms of the dollars and cents. Having said that, someone actually asked me in a panel session once, is it all right if the company pays me zero dollars, meaning I work for free? What do you all think? Ah? Hands up, say yes. You do? You, please, like you. <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't think that's a very accurate way. I mean, it's you, obviously, your time is worth something. So I think zero dollars is a bit too much. Lah, huh? Unless it's a charity and you really want to give back. Yeah? Then don't talk about the money part. But end of the day, you want someone who's sincere about you as an individual and what you can contribute to the team. Um, so giving some value amount is also important and not zero. Okay, so next question that Victor Tan has wrote out. Um, what was it? Okay, how have you seen your employee structure evolve as your company grew? How do you continue to scale while ensuring your hires remain engaged? So engagement is a big problem. We were talking about it earlier. People leave after a year at best to, you know, and they are your top performers. And, and how do you want to retain them and continue to engage them so that they will stay? Uh, we, we've seen the organization grow a lot, and um, we've gone from uh, 20 people to uh, 150, and we continue growing. Uh, obviously, uh, what we are trying to do is, um, is, is promote the people uh, that join us and that we trust, uh, and, and, and try to give them more and more responsibility and build um, under them. Um, if we find a role that is uh, unavailable within our ranks, then it's, it's something that, that we hire. Uh, we uh, we are starting to to have more departments, more more areas of expertise, more people leading those departments. And the big challenge that we find is is communication, communication within uh, the organization, uh, not only in Singapore because we are in six countries, and and, and a, a big chunk is also uh, 40 people, 50 people is in Spain, and the the time zone is very challenging, uh, communicating across time zones. When it's here at uh, 3 p.m., they start working there. Uh, uh, also have the U.S. And, 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 and then you can really go crazy with all these. You can really work 24-7. Um, but the main challenge that we find is right now is, is communication around the mission, uh, around the vision people asking us um, more, give us, give us more about the mission. If you grow the company, if you're not, that's not enough. <laughs> you know, so becoming very specific about, about those things and, uh, and with reason, because they need to have the sense of purpose in the area. So that's something that we are working Hello. on at the moment. Hello, testing. Uh, completely agree. I think the biggest challenge we face right now is, is communication. Hello, and testing, you know, one, testing one, two, three, four. <laughs> one, two, three. Um, hello, hello, testing one, two, three, four. Hello, testing one, two, three, four. Hello, testing one, two. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so communication becomes a big issue. And, you know, if you think about it when you're a small company, less than test, 10 test. people, if you have a certain objective that needs to be done, you can call everybody around the table. Here's what we're going to do. This is the plan. You do this, you do this. Uh, it's easier to coordinate. Uh, a, a plan, but as you grow bigger, you know, imagine having 100 plus people. You have departments, you have sub departments, everybody's sort of fighting their own fires. You know, the, the mission can remain the same, but be actually, people want to know what's the plan, right? What does that mission mean to me? And uh, at an earlier stage, you know, people know what it means. They exercise a lot of creativity and judgment. You know, almost anything that you do moves the company forward, but as you grow bigger in, in scale, um, you know, individuals impact by virtue of the size of the company gets less and less. Uh, and, and so they need their own sort of micro purpose within their department to be really strong to be able to guide them forward. And that's challenging because, you know, if you think of the overheads from a management perspective, even coordinating amongst uh, people in the executive team to <laughs> align on what needs to be done. Uh, becomes becomes a full-time job, right? Uh, and so uh, that's something that, that we are working on, but we found that what seems to resonate best is having that clear sense of purpose for each sub-team that aligns to the broader picture of the mission. If people are very clear on how their role contributes to the big picture, I think that's what uh, continues to keep motivated, but it's very challenging to 
to keep that constantly in tune and, and uh, to align the whole company to. So I, I, I come at this from the angle of what do companies struggle with as they grow um, and how do they maintain that engagement? Um, you know, the first 50 employees are generally sort of aligned. They all typically have a, an ownership structure. It's flat and then you start to get structure um, and you start to get levels and you start to get focus and people you know, maybe got comfortable with a multi-hat job. Now they have to kind of focus in on one job. Um, and that's when you can see engagement actually go down, or at least people start to question whether or not, oh, this place is changing, it's getting too corporate, or, um, you know, I remember when it was, when it was cool, and now it's not. Um, and so, you know, the real question is how do you sort of maintain that, that, you know, sort of level of ownership at your employees as you grow? And, and what we've seen kind of, you know, one of the effective strategies is, to sort of find a time when you can actually focus in on, I think you mentioned kind of the folks that you trust, the people that are performing, um, and you know companies sort of shift away from what we call sort of the peanut butter strategy of everybody's treated the same because we're all in this together, to actually identifying, you know, call it your top 25% that really buy in and are working, and how do we enable them? Um, how do we ensure that the people that are the real sort of advocates for what we're doing, maintain engage, in engagement. Um, and I'm not saying we give up a, a, the other 75%, but programs that sort of enable and, and impact them the most tend to have a way of flowing down versus trying to kind of keep everything equal. Um, I, I don't know if that's exactly the right way to say it, but um, you know, kind of focusing on the people that really get it. Do you mind to repeat what was the question again? Something <laughs> I'm not sure whether I'm going to answer correctly or not. So yeah. guys, you don't have to do this like I ask a question yeah. and the mic gets passed along. Yeah. You know, anytime you want to say something, just jump in, okay? Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. I'm a very, yeah, sometimes be disruptive in sure, our own sure, panel. Sure, sure. Yeah, so the question was beyond the dollars and cents, uh -huh. how do you continue to uh, no, re, uh, retain uh -huh. and engage your employees? Uh -huh. Especially the tech guys, right? Because um, there are so many positions out there. They literally don't have to look if they're any good. People just find them. Uh -huh. So then the question is, how do you ensure that they continue to want to stay with you and not drag onto another project that they think is more exciting? Okay, I think first of all, tech guys are also human beings. You know, <laughs> they're not like a pet. You know, they have their demand. You know, also they may have girlfriend, they may have wife, they have uh, kids. So you need to be flexible enough to take care of everyone. So basically, a structured way of uh, handling this kind of uh, uh, human requirement is very important from company uh, HR operations and also from so-called uh, founders, you know, uh, willingness to take care of everyone. For us, we have a kind of flexible, you know, uh, working uh, you know, arrangement so you can take care of, ca ki uh, ca of uh, uh, you know, uh, kids. Maybe, you know, you need to, you know, wait at home to wait for icon to be fixed. So basically, for for you, usually the, the guy who work in, uh, in uh, work in Visa should be the guy staying at the home to work at home and then waiting for the uh, icon to be fixed. So so we provide this kind of flexibility because also we know we cannot really you know uh, compete with the uh, uh, Google that's for you know do dollar dollar dollar. Sorry, just yeah. to interrupt. You said the guys working in Visa are the ones that stay at home and look after the kids, is it? Uh -huh. All the no, no, single no, no, no. women out there, yeah, they are. Yeah, hands up. Apparently, get your husband from these hands. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's why I've always wanted. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so side I'm topic, side about, topic. Yeah, I'm not talking about uh, engineering, I'm just talking about, you know, general uh, or senior, you know, uh, the, this operations. So, for example, for uh, uh, we also have foreigner. Uh, for foreigner who work in this time two years, I mean you may not really eligible for like a, like four months, you know, uh, uh, paid, uh, you know, uh, maternity leave. But we also pay you one more month, so to, so that you can stay at home, you know, to keep to take care of your kids. You don't have a parent, you know, take care of them. So so we need to be flexible. That we, we probably I can uh, list out more example. But the key thing is uh, you know to retain the people and uh, you need to be flexible. And also different states we have different type of you know the demand. You know, because uh, on early days, you know, we don't have uh, so many married, you know, people, and they, most of the people don't have kids. But now, with the renewal requirement, I think after, I think probably one more, one year, two year later, will be new, you know, uh, requirement. But come to the tech guys, of course, you know, we need to, you know, uh, uh, let the engineer to decide what 
technology they want to use. They have a, a lot of vendors approaching us. I'm not a guy who makes decisions, but I'm the guy who really do the work to make decisions. And then, then because they know they are empowered to do this, and then they will actually you know, find the best thing, which is suitable for them and also suitable for the company. Also, the more important thing is that good guy if you work with good guys, right? So, so if you keep actually a hiring standard high, and you are getting more and more good guys. And then, because the other good guy feel that maybe I go to other place, then now you don't have a chance to work with these good guys, you know? So though maybe other place pay top dollar, so uh, that's a rough idea. So I like what Guangda said about the flexibility. I really think there's no one size fits all because it depends on your people, right? And what exactly they want. So some of these things that come up, right? The latest one is the, uh, the study by Harvard that said that flexible work-life arrangements was the thing. Did you all read that? I mean, at one time it was what, bring your pet to work or something. Yeah, so these things come, these things go, but it really depends on the size of your company, what you can offer, and, and it's not a cookie cutter thing. La. So if you think that you're going to be able to you know, effectively take whatever you learn and, and copy lock, lock, stock, and barrel, it's probably not going to work. So here I will stop, I pause. Any questions from the floor? Yes. I would like to split the question into two. I would ask founders to, looking back, to tell when do you think was the right moment to hire a talent acquisition or HR person to help you to achieve what you want to do. And then I would like Juliana to be the last one who would address that. Thank you. Uh, Juliana, to do what now? Uh, oh, yes. oh, okay, sure. Never hire a HR person. <laughs> Start first. I think the moment you get the first check, is the time to get a professional HR. Yeah. So, so I, I, I. He says it's very progressive, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you know, uh, uh, if you don't have a, uh, uh, because you see, this is like a product manager. Everybody think they are product manager. Everybody think they are HR. But actually, this is a professional. You even want to grow the team, you need uh, actually professional people to do it. Or same thing for finance. So I uh, think my idea. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the moment you project that you're going to be scaling your headcount is probably when you would want to invest in hiring a talent acquisition uh, person. Uh, for us, at this scale, so we're about 180 people across the group. We've got four people in our talent acquisition team. Uh, serves two functions. Number one, reduce the cost of uh, relying on external recruiters. Uh, secondly, it is uh, insurance policy against retention as well, right? So the most disruptive thing to the business now is, you know, some key person is going to leave there on two months' notice. You know, if you, you know, it takes two months to source for candidates uh, in the first place. By the time they serve their notice and they join the company, you have a gap, right? So uh, having a, a, a dedicated uh, TA team to work on you know backfills plus new hires and all that uh, becomes uh, uh, insurance policy once you have a company that's at scale as well to um, you know manage uh, manage the the negative effects of, of uh, attrition within the company. Um, so we don't have a HR person and uh, we desperately need an HR person. Uh, and we are trying to hire one. We do, however, have uh, recruitment uh, professionals in-house. And uh, for us, um, the moment we hired them was uh, for Series A. The moment we closed Series A, we uh, realized we're going to grow, grow very fast. You can obviously outsource uh, the service here, but the rates are going to charge you like 15 or 20% of the gross salary of the person. So the moment you intend to hire five persons in a year, uh, you can afford uh, a recruiter in-house, which is going to give you a lot more flexibility. Sorry, guys, it was the, the Hudson guys around there. Uh, but it's just pure economics, right? Um, so for example, for us, let's say last year we hired 50 people, right? I mean, that's uh, the 20% of that is, is tremendous. Um, you can, for us, it doesn't make sense uh, to put it outside. You have to build it in-house. And uh, going forward, we'll, we'll continue doing that. What we do also, for positions that we cannot source ourselves because they are very senior or all that, then okay, then one, two guys, you, you, you engage a consultant, but not for the 
for the for the volume. So I'll answer your question. Um, basically, I think our startups are very fortunate. We have SG Innovate. And whatever roles they tend to can't fill, can't fill or they have difficulty in filling, they, they come back to us. And if they are really very small, so these guys are quite established, uh, so they got some brand name recognition, etc. But for some of the startups that we work with, they are like less than 10 people. They don't have that clout that when they publish on, say, LinkedIn jobs, no one applies for it because this company is just too small, never been heard of. Uh, so SG Innovate actually steps in to help them. So we're kind of their HR person for the time being until they're big enough, right? When they hire their first recruiter. I mean, a recruiter and a HR person aside separately, right? Then you're talking about employee uh, culture and stuff like how do you want to engage your, your, your employees, etc. Things that you want to build on. You probably want to start early because if you get uh, the wrong fit, um, that startup could fail quite easily because it's the right type of people you want to bring into your company. Uh, people think that, oh, it's just one more hire in a bigger organization. It doesn't really matter. The chain is actually weakest where it's the weakest link. It doesn't matter if your entire chain is strong. You just bring in one weak link and it'll break. That's how I look at it. So you need to find the right HR person for you because they're HR administrators, which are quite easy to find, and then they're HR, HR people. Not so easy to find. Yeah, so it depends. I mean, it, it really works. What can you afford? Whether or not you want to bring in someone early to work with you alongside you as a founder to establish the, the culture, uh, the type of you know, people that you want to bring in, who you want to bring in, why do you want to bring in. Um, and the HR probably should be the person asking you those questions. If you as founders have never thought of it, then it's time to start thinking and someone's got to ask you, right? So you guys were saying that you, know, um, you might be the te technical experts or you have the certain speciality in this particular area, but most of the time the founders that I meet don't have the human part, as in they don't, they don't think about the people part of it. They just think about the wonderful tech they're doing, how they're going to solve some major world crisis, etc., etc. But they, they forget about that they are dealing with people, human beings, and how do you attract them, how do you entice them. Um, you know, they think that by offering a sexy job, maybe or an interesting title or, or more pay, I don't know, it would attract people. But it may not be so, right? Yeah, so it depends. So you need to ask all these questions. And the HR person should be the one poking at it and asking you, like, is this the right direction? Why are we doing this? Is the company heading there? Is that what you really want? Yeah, so those are the questions that you need to ask yourself as you are building the team. Any, any other que great question? Any other question? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, so first of all, HR people are my client, so I would say they should be your second hire. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> selfishly, but but I think the uh, you know the big thing that we always work with our founders on um, that we work with really is that that engagement with their investors um, and your biggest expense is your employees um, and so when you're asking those questions around engagement or turnover or you know when you need somebody to kind of dive into the data of what's going on with your biggest expense. If it's your CFO that's answering those questions, um, usually you're not going to be able to give the right answers to the board. Um, you know, one of the areas where this comes up with a lot is as we look at equity pool um, and needing additional shares, for instance, to, to grant to our employees. Um, the first question is, who are your highest performers? Um, for those companies that haven't kind of made an investment in HR, sometimes that's a tough question for them to answer. They don't have the ability to measure that. Um, and that can be frustrating because now investors are like, well, if you don't know who your highest performers are, what do you know who's, who we want to retain? Um, so I think that, you know, if we think about it from kind of an investment perspective, our largest expense is employees. Um, you know, who's monitoring that and who's making sure we're getting the best return? Um, it usually makes the case for, for hiring that CHRO early. I like I like to add on that on the on on, on the retainer and, and obviously the mechanism that we use to retain employees on top of the motivation and the cool job and the talent and, and the, the napping and the, the money is the ESOP right the stock option and um, interestingly we realize uh, it works very well for for the managers and and uh, the slightly more senior guys uh, depending on, your, on the jurisdiction for example in Spain uh, they consider as wet paper. And uh, also here in, in Singapore, 
we started to offer across the board stock options uh, as a company policy uh, because we make a higher we consider you know it's, it's right and, and we you know we commit we go with the with the with the weight and and, and we put it there and then we increase and uh, oftentimes we ask them well just to see how they react will you be willing to compromise on your fixed salary i give you more iso and and the reaction is always the same they don't most of the times especially for the junior and, and mid level they don't care about the ESOP. They care about, about the cash, the hard cash that you give them because they feel there's no value on, on that. Um, and then what we realized probably was a mistake that we didn't have a liquidity plan uh, for the ESOP. And, um, and we are putting that into place and we are facilitating the liquidity of some uh, from that ESOP. And we start to see the table turn because the word is out. This is not wet paper that they give me. This is really has value. So just putting the ESOP in place is not going to make it. You are, and, and that's very challenging, especially for small companies with, and not that we are very big, right? But we, we start to have that, that ability to put liquidity in there. Yeah, and, and I think that will turn very quickly as soon as we have some companies that either go public or are purchased and we see ESOP plans actually, you know, create wealth um, and, and sort of create that ecosystem. Um, because that's sort of the transaction of, of how, you know, the ESOP sort of started in sort of massive use in the Silicon Valley probably 20 years ago in the first dot-com boom, right? It was, that was the equity and there was a bunch of companies that had liquidity. As soon as we start to see in this environment that liquidity, it will very quickly become the currency. Um, and it's, you know, there's companies right now that are on the path that I think will, will change the environment. Yes. Hello, panel. Uh, I'm Christina um, from HR. Um, right now, coaching a promising startup. Um, I'd always think that um, enterprise fail because uh, we have uh, poor leadership. So my question to the founders, and of course you can add on as well, um, what is one thing you have done right where you think uh, is a manic for, for talents and, and people who wants to follow you? So I just want to repeat the question. One thing I feel I do it, did it right, you know, so that people follow me. Uh, one, one thing is not enough. La. So, <laughs> so you need to be you know, consistent. You know, so if you do one thing, you know, after one month, people will forget. So, so you will be a consistently, you know, keep a high standard, you know, take care of people, you know, fight for their benefit. Even I'm a founder, I mean, this is, uh, uh, we also have a ball, you know, there are a lot of complexities, but it's a good ball. So, so we need to also fight for my people, you know, benefits and also, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, you also need to take on small things, you know, these people want to sit there, you don't want to sit there, here, you know. Uh, 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 I, I think it's very hard to just select one thing. Maybe there are so many things I have done, so it's hard to do it. So, yeah, maybe I think it's... <laughs> uh, for me, it's definitely going to be the focus and attention to culture. Um, you know, so having the right like-minded people together, not from a, not like-minded in the sense of, you know, everybody having the same opinion, but sort of a, a, a similar way of working and resolving disagreements and, you know, coming to to the truth, right? Because ultimately we're all just seeking, <laughs> seeking the truth and the right way to do things. Uh, so culture has been the strongest thing. And, you know, we go to the extent of you know, from 2015 onwards, we included as part of our interview process a culture interview. And this is really, you know, a lot of behavioral questions and people are intrigued. They're like, wow, you take this so seriously that you have an entire interview dedicated to culture. And we actually reject, people can overrule, uh, you know, my recommendations to hire someone because they're not a, a culture fit. And we've, we've had turned down, you know, very senior people who are, you know, great. They tick all the boxes from a, from a from a qualifications and and, and uh, you know capability standpoint, but when it comes to culture, you know they weren't able to answer questions directly about you know how they they you know what were the biggest disputes they had, how they had how they handled disagreements with people in the past, uh, and if it's not aligned to our values, we we don't hire them. 
Uh, the most important thing is when, once you have a culture misfit, you know, sometimes they do get through, right? Some people can be good at interviewing and what they say and what they do may be different. So you're trying to eliminate as much risk as possible, but the moment you identify it, regardless of their performance, you have to solve the problem because, you know, like uh, Judy said, it breaks the entire chain and just takes one person who is negative, who's like sowing discord, like, oh, you know, the CEO sucks or, you know, <laughs> whatever, whatever it might be, right? But it's, it starts, you know, fermenting into a gossip mill and, pe you know, talking behind other people's backs. And that's not what, what you want. So I think focus on culture, make sure you, you have an environment of no politics. Uh, most important thing, uh, I think we've done a pretty good job at that and weeded it out, you know, put conversations in the table, make people talk face to face, address things openly when there's any issue and tension is the best way to sort of resolve it. And, uh, you know, I, th I think that's done a lot of things in helping us hire people, take pay cuts. They're like, wow, you know, like this is a great environment. I'm willing to, I'm willing to take a pay cut to, to join this company because I feel like I, I want to operate in this space. Right? So. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a founder that I've worked with when they were Series B, um, I started working with her, and it's now a Fortune 500 company, so um, I think she's a pretty successful founder. Um, and I would say the one thing that, you know, I've seen her do is really push back on kind of whatever I tell her best practices. Um, she's called me a lot of names over the last five years, uh, but it's really been her kind of sticking with you know, wanting to maintain a certain culture um, and a certain environment, and she has kind of a set of tenants that she sticks to, um, and her employees really know that, you know, when she's gonna be stuck with the tough choices, she's not gonna lean on, you know, market data or whatever, she's gonna be true to what it is that they told, what she told them that she, they're signing up for. Um, and so, you know, that's that's something that I think um, you know it's kind of that consistency, um, even as the company's gone from you know a five hundred million dollar valuation to a twenty five billion dollar valuation. I, I I always say that technology companies are not really about technology. It's really about people. Without people, you don't have anything, right? And and therefore that means you have to go where the talent is uh, to build your business. I started Tiger uh, in twenty oh nine. Um, out of Austria, uh, that was not very successful. I opened at the same time in Spain. Um, we, I moved to the US, to Chicago, I did two years there, also not very successful for different reasons. And it's only when I moved to Singapore in 2015 that I started in the, the, in the good environment uh, to build this, what, what we needed, and call it just coincidence or uh, whatever. But we also find uh, the right people uh, with the right motivation, with the right education. The education system in Singapore is very, very strong, very solid. I see, I hire people fresh out of university and I look at them and say, dude, you just do that. I mean, they, they do things I was not able to do at the same age. They are very mature and very um, disciplined, hardworking, intelligent uh, people. Um, and, and without that, we could not have built what we have uh, today. So I think uh, NUS was recently ranked the computer science uh, second in the world uh, of uh, uni as a degree ahead of MIT. I mean, some ranking, right? <laughs> uh, but you know, it starts to be uh, significant. Um, so I would say the the thing that we do we did right for chance or for vision or I'm not that smart, but whatever it is, uh, is come to Singapore and uh, and build a company here. Uh, because we found the right talent uh, to build and, and grow. Uh, I just want to hear from you guys. Uh, what are the various milestones of growth that you've witnessed where you have to, or you find yourself having to reinvent your compensation program, your employee engagement, and, and these kind of schemes and incentives? Yeah, typically, I, I agree. I think it's probably tied to fundraising, um, where you hit a certain critical uh, milestone in terms of people, and you're about to pursue your next wave of growth. You need to do a bit of housekeeping to do that. Uh, for us, it was, 
you know, 30, somewhere between 30 and 40 people, you have the decoupling of uh, people wearing multiple hats. So up to about 30, 40 people, you know, the, there'll be certain people within the team that straddle multiple people. Uh, typically at that stage, you start hiring a bit more experienced executives. You need to reshuffle and reorder the ranking of people. This is where titles become a huge headache because if you were very, so one of the other reasons why people join startups is title inflation, right? Like, and, and you know, they move from being a manager at some large MNC, they come join a startup or I'm a VP of, of, of whatever, even though they're not necessarily. And if you're successful, this is a problem only if you're successful, right? So if you're successful and the, and the company is growing, you realize that the person who was the VP of whatever, who previously was a manager is no longer <laughs> qualified or capable to be a, 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 a VP. Uh, and then you start, if you introduce the title of VPs, then you know somebody who comes in who's more experienced needs to be a SVP or a, a, you know whatever associate VP and you have all these issues. So we completely got rid of uh, VPs. We have very descriptive roles. So we have managers, we've got leads, and we've got like heads of departments because then it doesn't matter <laughs> You know whether you're more senior or not. It's it's tied to the responsibility of the role. But I would say those are some of the key key uh, milestones. Uh, what I remember in our company history is uh, <coughs> definitely I mean the uh, first round of funding is a milestone. So I mean, we are so much below the market rate. So <laughs> you know we need people to have a decent life as well, right? So uh, that's is very important. So we come back to the market rate. So or at least close to market rates. And then later, I would say, even we have a fundraising from time to time, but still we are very, very careful about what's happening on the market. It's not really about milestone. Every month is a milestone, because every month still be people movement in the market. You need to be very, very you know, alert about these things. And uh, also keep you know, adjusting this, uh, you know, your competition plan, you know, uh, either pure cash or cash plus ESOP or other ways. So, so it's like a continuous process. So if you think this is like a one time you know, fix and then you know, leave it for a couple of months, you'll pay a lot of debt later. So this is my take about it. So I, I would answer this question, uh, you know, when are we asked to do things differently by founders? And usually it's the first milestone is kind of the product development phase. Uh, the second milestone is sort of revenue and then there's revenue levels where things change. Usually the kind of 10 to 20 million, it starts to look different, and then 100 million is when it really starts to change. Um, and then of course, way later, uh, it's profitability. But I would say, you know, those are the moments when things can sort of change for companies. Um, and they can be kind of cultural changes almost. And um, the example I gave of the founder was, she's done a great job of, even as the company has experience tremendous growth, it's two billion in revenue, it's still a product first company. Um, and she's done a great job of kind of blocking everything out, right? And uh, she has this belief based on where she came from that salespeople add no value. Um, that <laughs> it's really interesting conversations we've had. Um, but, you know, really she wants the engineers to be in the room selling. Um, the salespeople just get the meetings. She wants the engineers to sell. That is a thing that should have been challenged and has been challenged all along. And she's kind of steadfastly just sort of stuck with the engineers are going to drive this, and that's how we're going to play this one. Um, but she has been challenged with that philosophy at every stage. And it makes the most sense in product development. Does it make sense when she's having calls, you know, now earnings calls? Harder to explain, but she's sticking with it. All right. I think the, the unfortunate news is I have two questions. So maybe we'll pick one to, to answer, right? So I think today we talk a lot about retaining talents, and I'd like to take a step back and think about, should we retain everybody, right? And, and I, I, I like to ask you guys, how, how do you decide which type of work to, to outsource and contract and for, for, for a short period of time, as opposed to uh, the, the other type of work that's more suited to hire staff and actually want to retain them in the long run? 
So that's the first one. And the second one is how to decide whether the, the earlier joiners are still the best fit uh, for the head of department or even management when the company actually grows and you hire some professionals or experienced hire from outside, do you parachute them to become management or the, 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 you know, the or earlier joiner, you, you keep them? Um, if you parachute it before any consequences or any lesson learned around that, uh, you know, love to hear some shit. And uh, you out, I mean, what we do is outsource whatever is not core, uh, all the surrounding stuff. You don't want to outsource your core because you don't know where that people is going to go. What was the last one? Ah, but it's, it's, it's self. You, you press it, they go down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it becomes evident. Uh, they have, uh, maybe you promote uh, a guy that is very interested in the technical aspect, not necessarily a manager, which in my mind is a mistake. Just let them do all the technical stuff if they are good and eventually you get a 10 or 15 or 20 year all experience uh, programmer, which is amazing thing to have, but they tend to uh, put them as manager. If that's what they want to do, it's fine. Uh, but then it's it might become evident that either his interest or his capacity is not there. But it seems that you don't have to force it, it just becomes very evident in the organization. And actually it's a living thing, right? You don't, you don't have to go as a, as a CEO or whatever and say, now I put you here and now I put you there. It comes from the bottom. Uh, the people that is working with that person is going to communicate uh, their discomfort or their preference somehow. So actually I don't believe in uh, power like from the top down. I think the power is exercised from the bottom up and you are a CEO or manager or VP or whatever it is, just listening and try to react to what the organization wants and, and, and try to align that where you think and believe the organization should go. If I'm okay, then it's, no, it's half of this and no, that, for me it doesn't happen that way. Uh, yeah, so first of all, yeah, you, you can't retain everyone. Uh, you probably shouldn't tr try to, um, you know, and the people that you want to manage out of the organization are people who don't perform, right? So this is sort of basic performance management. What are the KPIs that's supposed to deliver? You know, were they reacting and developing plans in the right way to deliver those KPIs? And the moment you start seeing, if it's a short-term dip, then how do you manage that performance to get them back up to levels of your expectation? And if it's a, obviously a consistent dip when they're unable to meet expectations, then that's when you manage them out. Uh, for me, the second question is a bit more interesting because I faced it several times. Um, so I, I would say the people, well, one of the key roles of a CEO is to know what good looks like. Uh, and you only know that by triangulation, right? So, you know, what, what is a good CMO for your company? You have no idea until you start talking to people and you say, oh, you know, what do you know that I don't know? How do you do this? How do you do that? Uh, and you know, you, they could be mentors or advisors, but you, know, you need to have a sense of what good looks like so that you can calibrate the level of talent that you have, that you can calibrate people who are interviewing and applying for jobs uh, to be able to know where to place them and see whether they're, they're fit for purpose. Um, I would say people in the organization earn their right to, to keeping that role as long as they keep knowing what to do and they keep delivering against their commitments. So, uh, and it's and it's fair, right? Because people can evolve and grow as long as they are proactively being able to craft the right strategy. You know what good looks like. They're able to deliver on 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 those commitments. They earn the right to step up as the organization grows. But the moment they start lagging behind, typically, if you if you look at it as a chart, expectations are here. At some points, it meets expectation. And then after a while, the the rate of incline may be slightly different. That's the time when you need to consider whether it's time to. Uh, bring somebody else in. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I will just offer some statistics. I mean, mature companies globally tend to have, and this may be surprising, almost 20% turnover, you know, kind of mature, right? Um, so if you just kind of start with that stat, and that's usually about three quarters of it is um, involuntary and 5% is voluntary, um, that's kind of gets you to you're managing out 5%, you've got a 15% that you would love them if they stayed, 
right? So I think that's where you should sort of focus your, your energy is on, you know, making sure that 15% isn't your top five or 10% of your performers. Um, and the outsource question, I, I don't know. Okay, uh, from my perspective, of course, I mean, if this guy uh, you know, doesn't fit the environment, and also if he doesn't leave, the other good guy will leave because everybody works together to see each other. Very simple. So, but sometimes you, in reality, it's very hard because more people just do the work, and you know it's not excellent. You just kind of like waiting for him to like make a move. So it's a, a happy uh, for everyone. So uh, I also uh, also I think uh, I, I I think for the non-core part, we want to outsource. Not outsource, we better software. If there are some smart guys over there building software, we just buy it. This is not our core piece. You know, we need to you know uh, pay them to actually uh, uh, to use their uh, products. So uh, thank you. So the uh, second question, I think the second question is the uh, oh, parachuting. Okay, sure. So we we have a tradition, you know, to actually bring people up, you know, to train our leaders. So they're very critical, you know, because these are the people, especially the early co members, <coughs> they have the, you know, the the uh, they share the same vision, and also they have the trust, and also they have the impact. Probably the, what they they are missing is a bit of like so called management. You know, but these are not the uh, rocket science. You know, you bring them to schools. You know, bring some leadership workshop. They will actually get some techniques. You know, to do things. So, but for the sales and for the business, this is very hard because you know whether you close the deal or not close the deal. So, to be honest, in the company setting, it's a pure KPI driven. Either you can manage to actually achieve the target or not. I mean, it's very clear. So, it's not about whether early member or not. It's a very, very you know uh, realistic environment. So, but for the tech side, we tend to bring more people up. You know, from the uh, the ground, yeah. Long before that happens, so that's important. The communication piece. Personally, I like training my people so that they are able to take the much la larger jobs. But sometimes they just don't want to because they're happy where they are. And then you have to bring someone in, possibly. Now, all these things that you need to consider, but back to the basics, right? End of the day, it's about communication, being honest, truthful, telling the person exactly where they're doing well, where they're not doing so well, what you can do to help them. And if you take your um, position as a leader in the organization, as helping your fellow teammates along, then you will do what's best for them, and they will reciprocate back to you. So that's how I feel. Uh -huh. Okay, yes. Yes. Uh, I'm from MD. So another founder, another startup company that's a sort of a profile company of SG Innovate. I just want hey, to don't ask... Don't make us lose face, uh, SG Innovate. <laughs> sorry. I just want to ask a very weird question for all the leaders here in the panel. Uh, can you describe to us like what are your leadership style? How do people perceive you? Or how do your employee actually perceive you? Either you are open, you are close, you are the very strict kind, or you are the very lenient kind. What's your leadership style? And how much influence do you have on your culture? As in, you could be very firm, but your culture is actually very friendly, very fun-loving. Um, yeah, so that's the two questions that I have. I, I think as a, you have all the influence in the, in the culture of the company. It's, it's the, the ultimate job that you have is to shape the culture of the company. Uh, I like to be perceived as, uh, I, I, I don't like hierarchy very much. I didn't go to the military. Um, so for me, it's flat and, and communication. But however, that in Asia, sometimes it's challenging because um, I, have, I, have, I have engineers and, and people and uh, I just want to talk to them. And, and I had one, I remember, it was like shaking, like, good, good, I mean, relax, I'm just having a conversation, <laughs> not going to bite you, let's go for coffee or something, I just want to talk to you. But just because uh, you are the CEO or something, uh, and, and I try to remove that completely. I, I understand it's cultural maybe in, in, in Asia. I don't like that. I, I want uh, my staff to be able to approach me and you go to our offices, everything is flat. Uh, there is no walls, there is no crystal walls. Anyone can come and talk to me or talk to the CEO or talk to the CFO. Um, I think you, by also by the layout of the office and, and how you are perceived by, by your employees, you are shaping the, the culture. Um, I, I like to think that I'm approachable and easy. That, that's what I like to think, but we should, we should ask them. Uh, yeah, I think I like to think they're probably <laughs> similar. 
uh, friendly, approachable, you want to be accessible. People value, I mean, once, once you grow as a company, people value the informal interaction. So showing care and concern, you know, how's your weekend, what did you get up to, you know, getting to know people personally becomes hugely important because that's, once you break that barrier, that's when the real things come out, right? So for me, uh, every time a new joiner comes in every week, I've got, you know, half an hour to an hour set up with all new joiners for that week to just, you know, get to know them personally, say hi, you know, start that conversation so they don't feel that, oh, you know, he's the CEO, right? So we do it over coffee, uh, very informal chat. Uh, and how you behave definitely has a lot of influence on, on the, the culture of the company and the, the, the style. Uh, but, you know, you can't compromise on results as well. So that, that's where you have to draw the line. So from knowing where it's a situation that was out of somebody's control to be able to do something about to sort of inconsistent performance. That's where you have to know that people have to know that you're firm, but also fair and that you're transparent about your standards. And I think, you know, ultimately it all boils down to communication. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we have at Aon and one of the things we always talk about with the founders and stuff is that like culture eats strategy. So it doesn't matter what your strategy is if the culture isn't there in order to execute it. Um, and so I think openness, transparency, we talked about in the workshop are huge, you know, not trends, but absolute needs. Um, and so a leader has to be open, transparent, and have, you know, the flexibility to adjust. Um, because if you don't have the right culture, it doesn't matter what your strategy is. So I think uh, uh, culture is kind of like a very complicated, you know, uh, every company have so many mix of things. I think for this sense, the culture at least I have come to view is, uh, you know, openness for failures and also, you know, encourage open innovations. I'll give you some examples. So, so uh, uh, some of, uh, uh, we, because we are working on, on, on computation areas and also uh, it's pretty cutting edge and uh, we follow all the uh, state of art uh, methodologies and also research papers. And then one day some people call me, hey, we get uh, some uh, top performance in some uh, uh, top uh, uh, computer vision conference, some of the uh, competitions. So, so actually, I'm not really aware of that. So, so our people actually, you know, are join this type of competition. But if they don't have time and they don't don't have the space to let them to try different stuff, so there's no way, you know, this kind of uh, 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 bottom up, you know, innovation will ne never happens. So I think this kind of culture will kind of like uh, integrated into our uh, day, day to day operations. We have our engineering team, we have all of them R and D teams, and uh, each team, uh, you know, can select things they like. It may, it may not work, but I would like them to try try out. I think this is the, uh, at least the culture I want to build up for technology companies. But of course, people are, uh, uh, look at me differently. For example, they have a bad traffic day. They think I'm very aggressive when I talk, you know, uh, I want the results. And they think in this way, right? So maybe there are some people who have gone through the corporate world and they, they probably they know, okay, I take care of people, et cetera. But it's a mixed feeling. But uh, as long as the result can be achieved, and uh, in the long term, people can see what the real behavior, the, the thought behind. Yeah. Well, Alan, I hope you answer your question. If you need to know more about culture and you want to know what I'm like, then ask my colleagues, uh, they're here. Yeah. <laughs> but we all had good bosses. We all had terrible bosses. I shall not name names. But I think the main important thing is you remember, right? You take the good and you leave the bad. And then you ask yourself, is that how you'll be treated as a person? If the answer is no, then don't do it. Yeah. Okay, last question. Anybody else? We have got two more. I take one though. Yes, please. Yeah, the lady in front. So I want to take you back. Uh, maybe you can talk about your first ten, five to ten employees. And like you sh uh, said, that you shifted from uh, Germany to Chicago, and then you came to Singapore. So how? Uh, I mean, those those would be your earlier employees. So do they still work with you? And uh, just just some journey or some thoughts or experiences around that. Um, no, they are not. <laughs> um, it was very challenging for us at the beginning. It was we were bootstrapping the in the business, and and it's very demanding when you start from nothing. And and we started the business in 2009. We did our Series A funding in 2017. Until then, we were trying to generate revenue and uh, and, and get by the the way we could. So the thing is that there are situations that I'm, I was single. I've been single until very recently. I didn't have a family, 
And probably because of that, I didn't have a family. But some other people could not go through the journey, if you know what I mean, right? Because oftentimes, you don't get a salary. We, at the beginning, no. Uh, I was very happy the first year we, I managed to pay for, uh, I started in a farm, and I, I paid for the rent. That's it. That was the first year, and, and we were working. So I could go through that because my expenses were very limited, but that of some other of the founders uh, with family and stuff, they can, they can take it so long. So you leave many people uh, along the way, not because you want them not to go with you, but because this is it's very hard, uh, especially at the beginning. Um, so yeah, uh, once you start into the funding cycle and stuff, things, things change. Uh, but for that, you have to build an attractive business that excites investors, that has some revenue, that you have a product that you sell, <laughs> the usual thing, right? So. Um, for me, I think we've got about maybe three or four of our first 10, 15 employees still with us. Uh, quite fortunately, in, in, in different roles, some of which have, you know, significantly progressed in their careers, some of them are sort of, you know, bubbling along <laughs> in that sense. Um, and once again, I mean, the key reason why they stay is, is the, the culture and the purpose, right? So when they see that they're progressing in their career, they're, they're able to make a, a contribution. They continue to like the environment that they're in. It serves as a strong uh, retention factor. Um, no. So uh, my, my early members are uh, co-members are still with me. And also, they are the co-members, they are the tech lead, manager, manager bigger team uh, in Visa and work with me more than five, six years old. But of course, it's not because you know they work uh, with me for so long, we promote them. So it's not because of this. It's because actually they also uh, show very outstanding learning skills and also you know evolve themselves you know among the process. So, yeah. Different people have different needs, right, in the times of their lives, as we all know. So, so long as the person is a good talent, you work with this person, I don't think you should narrow yourself at this is a former employee, former colleague, and I don't want to work with this person anymore. If that's the case, then obviously the person is not a performer. Lah. But if it's someone that's really helpful and at the time decide to leave, doesn't mean that the door is closed and they won't come back. So it's always good to maintain relationships, I feel. Okay, so we've reached the end of our session today. I would like to thank all of you for being in my living room, <laughs> the brewery at Bash, yes. And I hope you can join us for subsequent sessions. If you've got questions to our panelists, myself, or you want to know a little bit more about what we do at SG, maybe um, I'll be here. I was teasing about just now, uh, but more than happy to take questions after this. All right, thanks, guys.
Test, test. Test, test. Test, test. It was working a second ago. Because just now it was W. 